on uh, page seven of your, of your lecture notes. Um, he says, and this is in the middle of the page, the word isomorphism applies when two complex structures can be mapped onto each other in a ways that to each part of one structure, there's a corresponding part in the other structure, where corresponding means that the two parts play similar, similar roles in their respective structures. Um, this is how we're going to always use the term isomorphism um, in this class. If you're taking the abstract algebra class, it's going to mean something a lot more specific, and you're going to have a lot more details. Um, you might actually think of these as kind of a, what I'll say, but don't worry about, worry about it, is a, a homomorphism. And the idea with the homomorphism is that there are a lot more details here than there are here. Um, and you're, for example, there's no steering wheel. There's a steering wheel in a car, but there's no steering wheel specifically in a skateboard. So if you were to go, if you were to create a map from the car to the skateboard, that detail would have to go somewhere else. Um, but don't worry about the, those necessities. But when I say the term isomorphism, think of equals. And I'll often use that symbol right there. So this is going to be really important because it's going to be how we're going to get meaning out of things. And um, you'll see it a lot coming up over the book. But first I want to hop on and talk about recursion. Recursion is basically, it's seen everywhere, um, but it's kind of a, a list of instructions which you follow, but then repeat until you've reached kind of a, a final case. So suppose you were you're cooking, and you, had a, you, you could have a recursive algorithm for stirring eggs. And that would be um, whirl, and then whirl again, and keep whirling until essentially everything looks mixed up. That's a very loose way of understanding it. But another way, which you all are probably familiar with, and much more rigorous in the term of mathematics, is the Fibonacci sequence. Um, this is where you start with two numbers, one and one. And then you construct the next number by summing the previous two. So you have that, and you have three, and you have five, and you have eight, and so on. And you can create what's called a recursive definition where you define the nth Fibonacci number this is for n greater than or equal to 2 and here you define the thing in terms of itself and this is a classic example of recursion what it is is really itself on a smaller level um, I think one of the most exciting applications of recursion are, are fractals, um, because the way we create fractals is through recursion. So I don't know if you all have seen this, but the Sierpinski triangle, or the Sierpinski gasket, is kind of a classic fractal. Here you divide a triangle up into three, and then you just repeat the process for an, infinitely number of, an infinite number of times on each remaining triangle. And you create these very beautiful kind of mosaic forms. But the nice thing about mathematics is that we can be very precise and do things that we can't do in the real world. And that's repeat this infinitely, and so on. Um, just for a quick digression, and I, I really don't want to spend too much time on it, because Kern will, will do more. Um, why is it called a fractal? Does anyone know? Adding just like a fragment of something. Sure. Um, that, it was a term coined by Benoit Mandelbrot in 1977, I believe. It actually refers to its number of dimensions. So this might be a kind of a mind-bending concept for most of you, but we like to think we live in one, two, or three, or four dimensions. Um, all integers, right? But my claim is that the Sierpinski gasket actually lives in between uh, one and two dimensions. It lives in like one point six, three, something dimensions. Um, but I want to help you kind of think about that. And if you, if you want to hop along to uh, page nine, I've kind of got a recipe for, for helping you think about dimension. You know what? It's weird, because only mathematicians would ever worry about rigorously understanding the concept of what a dimension means. So here's one way to think about it. 
If you take a line and you double it, you have two copies of the line that you started with. This guy's here and there. If you have a square and you double the sides of the square, you have four copies of the original square. Similarly, and I'm not going to try to draw this because it will get too complicated way too fast. If you take a cube and you double each of the sides, you get, if you think about it, eight copies of the original cube. So if you're perceptive enough, you might kind of realize this action of powers going on here. So here we had, after our doubling process, two copies. We had two to the one. Here, after our doubling process, we had two to the two. After our doubling process here, we had two to the three, eight. So this is weird, because notice that the cube lives in three dimensions. And the square lives in two dimensions. And the line lives in one dimension. So this might suggest to you uh, the relationship that 2 to the d, where d is the dimension of the space you're living in, equals the number of copies you have after the doubling process. So let's return to our friend the Sierpinski gasket. If we start here, and we imagine doubling each of the sides of the Sierpinski gasket, here and here, we're very strangely led to the conclusion that whatever dimension the Sierpinski gasket lives in, it obeys this rule. So take the logarithms and d times. Sorry, this is getting crowded. If you take the logarithm on both sides and solve for d, you'll see that the dimension of the Sierpinski gasket log 3 over log 2, which is approximately 1.585 on to infinity. So here's an exact example of something which lives somewhere between one and two dimensions. And I think that's a really cool concept. Um, moving on for other tools for thinking, we have paradoxes. Um, paradoxes come in all sorts of different flavors. I don't know if some of you have heard of the birthday paradox, where it's the idea of, OK, What's the probability that someone else in the room has your same birthday? Everybody thinks it's really small, but if you actually work out the mathematics, it turns out you actually have a good chance. If you're in a room with over 40 people, you have an extremely high chance of finding someone else with your same birthday. Um, so I, I've actually listed out, um, and this is courtesy of, of uh, Wikipedia and Mr. Quine, um, we have sort of Three variants of uh, whoops. We have three variants of paradoxes. Um, this is a uh, veridical, and these are things which are true, um, but they seem paradoxical at first. Um, there's falsitical. And I'll give an example of each of these. And then kind of the classic, the one which we're going to be interested in, and these are real paradoxes, are antinomies. To give you an example of another classic paradox, and one which is visited in uh, Gertel Escher Bach very early on, it's called Zeno's paradox. And the idea is if I want to get from here to my laptop, I first need to walk halfway across the distance. And then, if I want to walk the remaining distance, I need to walk half of that. If I want to walk the remaining distance, I need to walk half of that. And then half of that, half of that. And eventually, I get stuck in this infinite loop where it seems like I'm not getting to my laptop.